Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Dharma Talk portion of our Sunday Dharma program, and happy Easter to all of you who celebrate. This morning, giving the introductory talk is going to be Tony Sager. Uh, Tony is a Bodhisattva teacher in our Sangha. He began practicing with Desan Sanim in 1978 while in college at Brown University. He has lived and worked at Providence Zen Center for some years and ordained with Desan Sanim in 1986. He had been a monk for 21 years. Tony had a long period of being apart from the Quantum School of Zen, as he had been with another teacher for some time, but returned back to the Quantum School of Zen in 2015. He and his girlfriend, Randy, recently relocated back to Providence, where he works as a psychotherapist. And then answering questions today is going to be our very own uh, Zen Master Sung Hyung, our school Zen Master. Zen Master Sung Hyung, Barbara, Bobby Rhodes, is the school Zen master of the Quantum School of Zen. Huh, I just said that. <laughs> she received Dharma transmission from Zen Master Sung Son on October 10th, 1992. She was one of Zen Master Sung Song's first American students and studied with him beginning in 1972. She was given Inca in 1977. A registered nurse since 1969, she currently works in hospice care, though not currently, you're retired now, I think, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> currently retired from hospice care. <laughs> she helped found the Providence Zen Center and lived here for 17 years, serving in a number of administrative capacities. Zen Master Sung Young has a daughter and lives with her partner Mary in California. So thank you both. Thank you everyone for coming. It's nice to see you and hi everyone online. Thank you for coming too. And uh, we're here at the Zen Center, we're a bit of a small, intimate group to, uh, this morning. Thank you so much, and it's so wonderful to be here with you and with Zen Master Sung Hyang, uh, who's doing, uh, leading the group in the, the last two weeks of Kyoche, so in the, the very last week of the 90-day Kyoche retreat now, the last uh, six days. So um, let's see, to begin my talk this morning, I wanted to tell a, a little a story which I was recently reminded of. Um, some... Uh, a month or so ago, when I gave an intro talk here, um, as I've done sometimes in the past, I told a little bit of my story of how I came to practice and um, kind of how my first question, this big question, so I'm not going to tell this story again because most of you probably have heard it, but I'll just refer to it for a moment. Um, kind of when I go, when I look back on my life and certain steps and things that happened to me that led me to eventually really coming into Zen uh, uh, Zen practice, this practice, there's certain things I can see that were kind of like steps or important events in my life. And the first one, um, which I told last month, was when I was very young, about seven years old, this question appeared um, because I, my experience, and I saw that everyone else's experience, was that life was so up and down according to whether we, you know, I got what I wanted or I didn't get what I wanted, things went my way or they didn't, etc. So I kind of told that story. And uh, all the adults, everyone said, well, Tony, that's just the way life is. And, and I, I thought there's got to be something, there's got to be, there's got to be another way. There's got to be some, some way, a different way of relating to my experience rather than just being subject to the up and down and whether I get what I want or not, because that's really, <laughs> it wasn't fun. And I was already like recognized it as suffering somehow at that young age. And I thought, so everyone, all the adults always said, well, there's, that's just the way life is. And I always said, thank you. But I was like, oh, there's, there's got to be something else. There's got to be. Otherwise, this really, this really sucks. You know, <laughs> It's going to be a long, sucky life. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so then, then another, another thing that happened to me, which was very, very impactful, and I was reminded of the story a couple of weeks ago. Um, my girlfriend, Randy, and I were visiting with dear friends, actually Mark Van Oppen, who I see is there this morning, and his, his wife, Julie, were visiting with them. And um, this story kind of uh, came up. So when I was um, um, about uh, 16 years old, I guess, so, or 17, anyway, it was um, the summer between my uh, um, junior and senior year of high school in New York City, where I was brought up. And um, I had this wonderful opportunity. I was into photography um, back then and had made it my own dark room in our house in New York and was really into it. And you know, this was pre-digital. And um, Anyway, um, I, um, I had this wonderful opportunity, actually it came to me in a very interesting way, but um, to work that summer with um, a, very, a, a very famous photographer, one of the uh, you know, foremost fashion 
photographers um, really in, in the world. Um, uh, people probably, you probably, I mean, unless you're really into that, you probably haven't heard of him. Um, his name was uh, Hiro, H-I-R-O. He was um, Japanese, uh, originally from Japan, uh, Hiro Wakamayashi. And, um, and he was a very, 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 uh, very famous and, uh, um, and very, he was a very, he was revolutionary in his approach to photography and his way of creativity and all. So anyway, um, um, I, so I had this opportunity to, to uh, work with him and, uh, at his studio. And of course I was just, the, you know, I was totally the low guy on the pole and he had his, you know, real professional assistants and all. But the first day that summer, when the first day I went to work, um, I, I showed up at the studio and then he called me into his, his office there and he, um, he, he had me sit down and he said, Tony, I want to tell you about something which is very important. And so this was um, the very first morning. And he said, I want to tell you about something which I call the creative process. And he said, um, he said here, you know, this summer, you're going to have, you know, all sorts of really cool things will be happening, you know, be, you know, be helping photo shoots and helping um, the, this other assistant, Jeff, to create sets for shoots, to build stuff and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, yeah, and you're going to see these really, you know, beautiful models coming in and all this kind of stuff, right? And um, so he said there would be all that interesting stuff directly related to photography, but then also we all help here. We all, you know, we all take turns sweeping the floor, cleaning the bathroom, whatever. And he said, so the creative process, what I want to tell you is, um, you know, it's very easy for us to, to divide things into interesting, not interesting, that which is, is not boring, that which is boring. And he said, that's just dumb. But when you bring, when your mind is just in the present moment, you just bring your mind back to what you're doing right now in the present moment, then there's creativity in that, even if it's cleaning a toilet. And, and he said that all creativity, it comes from being, being in, this, in the present moment. So he said, this is, I want you to know this, this is very important because, um, you know, too much of the time we get caught up. And he used these kind of words like liking this, not liking that. And so just always bring your mind back. And when you do whatever it is you're doing in the present moment, then that's just your life is right there. And, and, it's, and whatever it is, it's cool. It's, real, it's cool. It's okay. And, and everything um, all the creativity, everything comes from being in this present moment. And I was like, that just blew me away. You know, I was like, uh, it just really went into my whole, through my whole being. And it was somehow, I was like, I was waiting, you know, to hear something like that. I knew I was looking for something um, all these, um, you know, these years since that question first appeared when I was, you know, almost 10 years before. And this was at least a, a part of it. And I was like, God, I was like, Wow. So, you know, I never, I never um, for, um, forgot that. And, uh, and it's interesting because a few weeks ago this came up and then uh, we were talking about a uh, hero, my, um, Randy and my friends, and I was kind of wondering if he uh, still alive. And um, uh, I kind of you know, Googled him once every couple of years, but I guess it had been more than just a few years. And I just found out last week that he passed away in, in 2021. So it's been a little bit on my mind. And so... So that was very, um, a very, a very important um, experience for me. And when I look back on it now, I see like, oh, he was, he was my first, he was like my first Dharma teacher, really. You know, in a, in a little bit of a some more direct way, he he gave me my first Dharma teaching. Whether he was a practitioner or not, in some way, I have no idea. Maybe he he might have been coming from um, Japan and also, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and so then. Um, and then some, a couple, just a couple of years later, I had um, uh, my first semester at college, um, uh, second semester, I had a very profound experience, which really gave me some, some experience and some insight into before thinking mind and our greater nature, which is before thinking, before name and form. And that's what really started me off in the Zen practice. I met Zen Master Sun Sun uh, right after that and started practicing. And so, um, so just wanted to, I wanted to share that, and, um, and you know, and that, that is the truth. You know, our life, it, you know, it, it, it all comes from this moment. And when we're in, you know, when we're in the present moment, then when we, when we need to, for whatever reason, there's some purpose, whether it's whatever, however big or small that may be, you know, then we can go into the past. Maybe we're, 
you know, um, sharing a story about our past or we're try kind of unperceiving something about our past and we can go into the future, maybe we're got a, you know, planning tonight's dinner, we'd have to get at the grocery store or planning a trip or whatever. Uh, you know, what time we got to leave the house for a dental appointment tomorrow morning, things like that. So, but that's all happening in the present moment. But, um, of course, our, the human condition and um, our, how we, you know, we get tripped up and the suffering we create is that attachment to all that unnecessary thinking. So I always, you know, I always think of it this way, that every moment of our life, there's something that we're supposed to be, we're meant to be in a relationship to. Right now, for me, in this Literally, in this present moment, I'm speaking, so I'm conveying something to you, right, verbally, and you're, you're listening. You know, when I'm on the listening end of a conversation, if my mind goes off to what I might have for dinner tonight or something, then I've fallen out of the relationship to this moment, which is just listening to the person who's speaking. And so, um, so practicing is... is um, uh, so again, yeah, every moment, there, there's something we're meant to be in a relationship to, um, whether it's, it's, it's meditating, it's eating an apple, it's listening, it's speaking, it's using the pow- the, the, our capacity for thought in some way that we, that we need to apply that to. That's clear mind thinking. That's the truth too. But, then, but that's happening in the present moment, so there's purpose and direction to it. And, but then there's all that extraneous thinking that, that, uh, trips, that, that takes us away from the present moment. And so, um, you know, and so... Our um, formal practice is very, very important, and uh, um, I appreciate, you know, how we have um, a variety of practices here in our sangha. We have bowing practice, we have chanting practice, we have sitting meditation, we have walking meditation. Um, in, 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 in our retreats, um, more than one day retreats, typically we have formal eating practice. And so our, our formal practice is very, very important um, because our the human condition, our attachment to thinking, our habitual thing, it's so strong. And so and in everyday life, there's so much going on, so many things we have to attend to, we got to do, there's so many distractions, and you know, we're in movement, everyone else around us is in movement, so there's a lot going on. And so but when we enter to a, into a formal practice, whether it's bowing, chanting, sitting, walking, that's, so, that's like time out from all the busy, busyness of everyday life. And so... I, you know, it's, that's, um, and then we, in our formal practice, we create a very direct, a very intentional circumstance there because we're not doing all that other stuff. So then it's just oneself and one's own mind, right? And then so something very deep and transformational is happening through that. And then the fruits of that, the benefits, if you will automatically just carry over into our everyday life, our relationship with ourself, others, and the world at large. And so... So that's why form, formal practice is very important. It's kind of like, um, uh, you, know, whenever, you, know, and, you know, whenever we do a formal practice and we're you're just doing our best to come back, you know, just come back to the chanting, to the bowing, sitting, whatever it is, then we're coming back to don't know. So it's like our don't know factory in a way, <laughs> you know, um, don't know factory where, you know, we, through doing that, then we're building up more, um, c- connection with our don't know before thinking mind, building up more, more, more don't know energy, if you will. And then we go into our every light, day life and do all the things we have to do. And that's the other part of the practice is the informal practice, which is just as important, which is off the cushion as in a manner of speaking in the everyday life, all the things we do, relationship, work, taking care of this or that, cooking, then, oh, it's the same thing like in formal practice, coming back. What am I doing just now? As the San Sim always said, um, Zen Master Sun San, what are you doing right now? Just, just do it. Just come back. And um, just coming back to the present moment. And um, so, um, but, the for, so, but the, yeah, formal practice is very important, very, very important because of our, our, such our strong habitual thinking, that attachment that we human beings have. It's not good or bad, it just is, right? And like, like the Sansim always taught us, it's not, thinking's not the issue or the problem, it's our attachment. Thinking's important, and it has its place, of course. Um, it's very important, but it's not everything, and um, it's our attachment to thinking, to all that extraneous stuff. And so I wanted to, um, I'm going to read now, uh, this is just a very, um, uh, a very short thing. This is from um, one of uh, Zen master Wu Kuang, uh, Richard Trobe, who's in New York City, one of our 
uh, Zen masters in our Sangha. And um, this is from his book, Open Mouth Already a Mistake. And it's on the back cover. I'm sure it's probably in one of the teachings here in the book somewhere. I've never, haven't actually come across it ever yet. And I've read a lot of the book. But on the back, I just, I just love this. Um, it says, um, if you have no wants, then you have complete freedom and no hindrance. But there is no intention there, no helping this world. So I kind of understand that, at least my understanding of it is if you have no wants and you have complete freedom, then there's just, it's just like you're just free. There's, you know, maybe it's like in emptiness, maybe like attachment to emptiness, right? Just kind of right there, present, but there's nothing going on, right? So if you have no wants, then you have complete freedom and no hindrance. But, but there is no intention there, no helping this world. Zen has an expression, attain your mind, which is before thinking, before name and form, completely still and quiet. Next, perceive name and form. The sky is blue, the tree is green. Each thing is the truth, just as it is. But that kind of freedom is not the last word in Zen practice. In other words, just staying in that, in that, that, um, that place of before thinking of emptiness. The last word is, and he like as if he's saying this, quote, I cannot get freedom, I still want something, unquote. So how do I use my wants? If you have no want, then you can't have any desire. If you have no desire, then you have no feeling. If you have no passion or feeling, then you cannot have compassion. So how does one light the fire, cook the rice, and turn it into something that everyone can eat? That is our Zen practice. And uh, that's a beautiful, I love that, <laughs> that little teaching right there. And so, 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 so then our, our wants, or the uh, want or passion is just not, isn't just for me. It's not just for, I, you know, for this I, my, me. It's bigger than just myself, and that's, our, that's the direction of our practice for, um, for others, because we're not a separate self. We're all connected. We're not separate. The thinking, the delusional mind, thinks we're attaches to this notion of a separate self, and that's why we have so much suffering in, uh, in all the ways we do in this world, and there's so much of it, as we all know, but that's just an illusion, a delusion, and so... Um, um, so then, you know, our great want, our big, big want, big desire appears, and then how does that, so then how does that manifest in the world? So, you know, our practice, when we're practicing, we go, we're very quiet, there's kind of more of this internal, and, um, you know, in Zen on the outside, in our, in our Zen practice, um, although um, there are other Zen traditions which are more austere than, than ours, and I appreciate that, that we're not super austere. But anyway, it can look kind of cold or something or removed, but it's not. We go into it to practice, to perceive our true, our clear mind. And then, but then how do we, how do we manifest um, our, uh, our um, you know, wisdom and compassion in, out in the world? And that's our, that's our direction. Can I share one little quick story or should Okay, and I just want to end with one little story with something that happened to me a couple of weeks ago, and I just want to share it because it was, um, uh, well, anyway, I just, I kind of uh, appreciate it, although it may sound strange at first why I appreciate it, and it wasn't special or anything, but it was just one of these experience moments that happened to me. So about, I think it was two weeks ago yesterday, <coughs> I was, um, I had a doctor appointment at my, my PCP, so I drove over to there in Providence to the place, and then, and then in front of the where the, the office is, um, um, there was this one. There was one parking spot kind of available, and there was a car, you know, a car in front, car behind, and I thought, okay, that's just enough space for me to get in there, right? So I, I it was parallel parking, so I was kind of backing up, and I was looking in the rearview mirror, the, the car behind me, and I looked, and I didn't, I didn't see that there was any. I didn't think the driver was in there, but anyway, I was going back very carefully, you know, mindfully, and. Um, and I'm usually pretty good at judging, like, with the back of my car, not going too far. Um, but I went back, but I went back too far. I effed up. And, um, and I, I bumped, you know, the rear of my car bumped into the front of that car. And it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a huge, a very, you know, a, a violent bump or something. But it was like, oh, shoots. And then, immediately, then, then, then I was looking in the back view mirror, and I saw this you know, woman got out of the car. And I was like, oh, crap. And then, um, so I got out too, of course, and went behind. And she, um, 
she looked at her front bumper and it had a crack in it on the side and she was agitated, she was mad and she said, you, you fucking just, you know, did that. And um, uh, I looked and I was like, um, okay. And then I noticed that her, her bumper in the middle, it had like this hole in it. And then, but then first I was like, okay, did I do that or not? I wasn't sure, could it really have, could that bump have caused that? And, you know, I was also, there, would have, there was one part of me that thought, you know, maybe it was there before and this is an opportunity for her to get it fixed for free. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> thought, I kind of thought maybe I'm being, it could be possible, right? But I, you know, I said, are you sure? Are you sure I did that? Because I didn't hit you very hard. And she said, no, I'm sure it's a new car that wasn't there before. And I pointed out the, uh, the little hole in her brain. I said, but I didn't, I mean, I didn't cause that. I couldn't have done that. And she said, no, no, that was there before. That's from a, my, um, my driver's license in the front. It didn't work out. And then in that moment, I, I knew she was telling the truth. I believed her. I was like, okay, all right, okay. And then, um, you know, she was still kind of agitated. And I said, don't worry, we'll, I will take, I'll take care of it. And, um, and I told her, I said, um, look, I have to go to this doctor in the doctor appointment now, or others, I'm going to miss it. And um, I'll give you my phone number. And um, I can't, so I can't call my insurance and make a claim now, but I promise you I will in a couple of hours. I'll be home around five or so. I should be able to do that. And then she, she, um, she was like, yeah, but you'll just... Um, You'll just you'll just block me. I'm sure you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna do that. And I and I, I said no. I promise. I promise you. I will. I'm responsible. I caused it. I will do whatever I have to do to take care of that. She was still kind of stuck. And she said, "You promise?" And I said, "Yes, I do. I promise you. I promise you." And I said, "Take a picture of my license plate too, so you have my phone number and you have my license plate." So, okay. So she did, and I you know I told her I'd call her back and I would take care. And then um. So then I got home around five or a little bit later, and I, um, and she's in the meantime, like around a little bit before five, she sent me a text and she said, just want to check in if you're going to get back in touch with me. And then uh, before I called Gaiko, um, so my, like I knew her mind was agitated and she was also wondering if I'm really going to be honest and do what I said. And it, it was, it just was important to me. I, I wanted to put her mind at ease as soon as possible. So I, before calling Geico, I called her. She picked up, and, um, you know, and I said, Vanessa, I, I just got home, and I'm, so I just wanted to let you know I just got home. I'm going to call Geico right now, make a claim, and then I'll call you back and let you know, what, you know how it's going to be taken care of. And she said, okay. And I called Geico, made the claim, and they, and they got her information, and then I, I called her back, and, um, and she said, oh, I already got a text message from Geico. And I told her, okay, they're going to take care of it. Nothing on you. And you're also, Geico's also going to, if you have to leave your car in for, you know, a day or more, it'll also provide a, a rental car so you have wheels. And, um, and she just, and she was like, she said, thank you. You know, thank you so much, uh, Tony. You're very, very kind. And I really appreciate it. And I said, well, th I said, well, thank you. And I said, I'm so sorry that I caused, um, caused this problem for you. And I said, and it must have been when I was backing up, because she was on the phone talking to someone, it must have been, well, um, it was a, a joke, it must have been kind of a, um, a shock for you, and I'm sorry for that. And, and she said it was, but everything's good now, and uh, I really appreciate your kindness. And so that was just one, like a night, you know, that's like, you know, kind of like what, how our practice manifests out in the world. And it's not a big thing. I didn't do anything special. I just did what, what needed to be done, just did the, 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 the right thing, the, the, um, the right thing, and the, the, yeah, the right thing. And so, but in that moment when I just, you know, when I realized, okay, yeah, she's telling the truth. You know, I just totally believe her. It's like, okay, yeah, I need to own this, own it. And so then it became very important to me. I was kind of waiting to get home because I wanted to take care of it because I knew her mind was agitated and she was worrying that maybe I was just going to not follow up. And it was it just, you know, kind of knowing that, feeling her energy, it was just very important for me to, to um, put her mind at ease as soon as I was able to. And so um, I just... so. Um, not a, it's not a great situation hitting someone's car, but it was it provided a. Um, I appreciated the moment and the little you know we'll never see her again, never talk to her again. But there was a a connection between us in that moment. You know when I called her back and just in that you know that gratitude was expressed both ways and stuff. And there was uh, there was a preciousness in that. So, <laughs> so okay, I 
uh, could go on forever, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time uh, for, for, for uh, Zen Master Song Hyang. And please ask her any, any question that you have. Um, those of folks here in the Dharma Hall and then online, please um, also ask questions. And I think you usually do is if you have a question, then you uh, raise your hand on, the, uh, the, on the, the, the way you can raise your hand on there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I really liked your story about the lady. Yeah. Just these little things, huh? They're one by one. We can make it complete. So I don't know if I said that last week. There's this lovely little vignette in the Compass of Zen. And it says, um, one by one, each thing has it. One by one, each thing is complete. It and dust interpenetrate. So without cultivation, you are already complete. Understand, understand, clear, clear. So it's so simple. And if I had to give someone um, what is Zen in a nutshell, I think I would quote that because you need to understand that it's not about changing, it's about seeing the completeness, being with the completeness. And what he had with this woman with the, with the bumper is a completeness. So that there's the two of them, I'm sorry, I accept your apology, that kind of thing. It's very simple. And you can tell when it's, when it's complete. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. So a few weeks ago, I was talking to somebody here, and I mentioned that I was relatively new to practice, and that was fascinating to her. She asked me, how is your practice? And I had never even considered that question before, and I said, uh, it's good, I guess. So I want to ask a master, how is your practice? <laughs> Listening, listening to your question, that's how my practice is. <laughs> Just being with you right now. A good question would, for her, you've been, you, how long have you been coming? About a year and a half. Yeah. So I would ask you, like, what brought you here? What, what's kept you here? What's, what's the motivation? How do, how do you, you know? Because how's your practice? Um, that's kind of checking, like, She's not a Zen student to ask a koan, like, oh, show me your practice right now. That's like a Zen question. But, but maybe it's really curious, like, you came and you're still here. What brought you here? What keeps you here? And then you probably could really do quite well talking to her about that, right? Because you, you need to know that, each one of us. Like, what brought us here on an Easter Sunday, you know? Um, it's interesting as last week there was probably four times as many people, but it's, um, I went, oh, where is everybody? And then Tony reminded me, oh, it's Easter. So, so you know, it's great, it's great. And, uh, but what, what did bring us here? What's the point? And we're not going to keep practicing for any length of time or with any quality if we don't have a vow and a direction, you know, and we want to... We want to get enlightenment, which means we want to keep clearing our clearing ourselves, uh, doing what Tony was explaining with our practice. We want to be present. We want to be compassionate. We want to be kind. And a lot of people don't think in those terms. Uh, they really don't. Like, but, but we have a question: Why do you eat every day? You know, it's a very good question. So, but most of us don't consider why we eat every day. So if we come into the Zen Center and we have a direction to, 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 I say get enlightenment, but to clear things up, to, to know that our, our brain isn't 100% clear all the time. Oh, maybe it can get clearer with practice. You know, and um, the vow is to help others because that nothing feels better than how Tony felt after he finally said goodbye to her. You know, he, he, he helped her. 
in a way, more than just getting, taking care of his mistake, but he helped her by being kind and honest, you know, so, and each of us can know, uh, know that, that, oh, I had a day where I was kind and honest, and not the small I, but down in our gut, we feel some kind of sense of vow and direction, like, yeah, that's, that keeps getting revalidated, like I had a good day because I was kind and honest. Um, sounds like such a simple petty, not petty, but kind of, yeah, of course, of course you want that, but no, most people don't even think about those things on that depth. So I think most of you are here, you know, and also the people on Zoom, like, because they have, they want to keep learning to be kinder and be more honest and to be uh, there for people. And so, yeah. So I guess I long answer to a short question. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you and a happy Sunday. So I'm not sure if it's more of a question or I'd like to get your just feedback. So Tony was talking a lot about, you know, we talk a lot about being in the moment, right? Because we have this loop in our heads of there's this past, present, and future. But I guess where I'm asking is if you take away the man-made construct of time, aren't we always just in the present? Well, what Tony's point was that there's a lot of extraneous thoughts. So then we'll, we'll be entertaining, we'll be entertained by those, we'll be leaving we, uh, what our correct relationship function situation is this day or this moment or this time is we're just daydreaming or we're just wishing for something or you know we're we're in the, that area of of uh, not being not being present. So it's not about past, present, and future, but it's only about present. It's only about how is it just now. And then, as Tony's point was, there's live thinking where, oh, I need to drop off, I have to, don't forget to go to the grocery store because we need something for dinner. That's live thinking. Dead thinking is like, oh, I don't like the way we're eating, and I wish we had more money so we could go out more often, and da 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 da, like that kind of stuff. That's not, that's not directly alive for the day, you know, it's just like going off into the, some wanting tangent. You know, does that make sense? So, yeah, it's just, a, I, I think I said the same thing. I say this constantly, but if we could just notice if we're checking, if we're holding, if we're making, if we're wanting, if we just like notice it, like, oh yeah, that's checking. It's like, that's, that's invaluable. Like, you could, so then your clear mind isn't judging that or, or saying, oh, you're such an idiot, your practice is so shallow, or you don't do, <laughs> that's more checking, you know. We used to call it, you know, checking your checking. So you check and then you go, oh, God, I can't believe I did that. I'm always checking. So that's called checking your checking. And you can even um, check your checking's checking. You can say, Look at you're checking, you're checking again. So that's layer three, you know, third layer of checking. So that's a waste of time. But we go, as Tony went, whoops, you know, whoops. And then you just fix it. That's, that's not checking. That's like, whoa, what, what do I need to do just now? But just those, um, that's, so, that's the key, really, to, to uh, realizing that you can start to drop your... Um, your, your uh, extraneous thoughts, you know, you can just start to drop them. And it feels good. It feels very good. Yeah. Um, and it's so, there's so much um, that we, we have to learn in this life. It's never ending. And, uh, you know, for me, I just, I'm grateful for that. You know, I, at some point, I started to feel, you know, getting older, I felt like, oh, I, I I can't do that anymore. Uh, something just simple, but I, I can't. I can't jump like they were jumping in one of the yoga classes up there. They were just doing this short, you know, just bouncing up and down. And I can't do that anymore. It's funny because I'm in good shape. I can ride. I can ride half the day. I can ride for four hours on my bike, and I can walk up a hill. And I, ha I have a lot of energy, but but I can't jump. And so that's something that you just let go of. You go. Oh, I'm, oh, I should be able to jump. Well, can you just say, oh, this, this body doesn't jump anymore and not feel, 
uh, less than or something. It's just the way it is. And I don't think I, I don't think my knees can take it really. So, uh, so that's interesting. It's like it's not, it's not a self thing. It's down here. Oh, don't try that. That's not good. You know? <laughs> so, I was talking with someone just recently up at the retreat, and you know, really being hard on uh, on their uh, selves and. And you know, I just said, you know, you need to. It was about their body image and their how they're treating their body. And I went, you know, you gotta love that body. That's that's your vehicle. You were given this. You were given this wonderful thing that's gonna carry your consciousness through till it's time to to change, to to pass. And so you've got to appreciate that body. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to start to do that. To to not judge it, not to, but just to go. Thank you. Thank you. And so Zen Master Sung Sung used to say, it's not my knee, it's the knee. Mm -hmm. So like I, I have probably, I mentioned it all, my left knee is really painful when I sit sometimes. And, and it's like, but it's not really my, I just said my left knee, but it's like the knee is, uh, needs, a, a, mm -hmm. you know, it needs to be moved. It's not like doing it on purpose. It just, oh, that knee needs to be moved. And uh, it's, it's kind of neat not to, mm -hmm. it, to go, my this, my that, my this, but like, like even your car, the car, you know, oh, it, the car hasn't had its oil changed. You can see much more what the car needs if you're not making it my car. <laughs> I, you have to kind of see the subtlety of that when you're going through things. But uh, again, it's correct. How do you how do you relate to the knee? How do you relate to the car? What does it need? Um, so that brings up the question to, to always have that gentle question about not, you don't assume, you just question things like, oh, what, what is that? What does that need? And so that's why we teach Kung Lan practice in this school. So you're presented with something. Um, well, that thing I just quoted, uh, one by one each thing is complete, one by one each thing has it. Uh, and then at the end it says, understand, understand, clear, clear. And then after that in the text, it says, Picking up the Zen stick, and just imagine I have a Zen stick. Do you see this? And then hit it on the floor. Hit the stick on the floor. Do you hear this? And everybody says, oh, I saw that. I heard that. So then the koan is, so this stick, this sound, in your mind, are they the same or different? Then people are like, Tilt, you know, <laughs> begin, you know, people, it's, it's one of our, our, our t uh, koans we give to people who are just beginning to practice, but it's like, it's not always obvious what the answer is. And on purpose, because the medicine of that kung line is to get you to tilt with the opposite thinking, to just go, what? Uh, and we teach students just, of course, to do primary point. And after you, so you hear the stick, sound, mind, same or different, then there's no thinking. That's don't know. It's not, it's not magic. It's a, it's a very technical, skillful means that people develop through the centuries of Zen. Like, how do you get someone to stop thinking? Like, someone asks, like, Zen Master Rinzai, what is Zen? <laughs> like, he just shout. Why? He's trying to get them to come to. Just this, you know, one Zen master would just raise their eyebrow. What is Buddha? It just raised their eyebrow, just very subtle. And that opened some people's minds. Just always, oh, did you see that eyebrow go up? It's only that, so beautifully subtle. So, <laughs> makes me want to weep. <laughs> so... There's uh, online people. You've, there's more of you over there than are in this room right now. Does anybody have a question? Uh, well, another person in the room has a question. I don't see any little orange hands, yellow hands. Um, yes. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. You got my attention when you talked about you, you can't jump anymore. Mm. And even more so when you mentioned about, oh, the pain in my knee. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have a version of, the, of that. Yesterday I was sitting out on the 
beautiful spring day and I have, I can't do a lot of things that I used to be able to do. And I was very aware of how good I felt just sitting in the sun on the deck out there while my wife is out going on trails and things that I used to love to do. And so I, I, I have a fundamental understanding about how my thought processes can add on and create suffering. And, and I was feeling really good about the fact that I was, I was able to um, you know, really watch some thoughts about, oh, I can't, blah, blah, no, 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 turn the dial. And, um, but then there's a level of pain that can occur in my experience that draws me into unconsciousness, into story making, catastrophizing, because the pain experience is so loud. And um, I'm not expecting that you or anyone have some uh, patented answer to this um, um, challenging part of the human condition. But I was wondering if you have any perspective about how a human body deals with um, a level of pain that almost feels beyond their reach. Beyond their? Beyond their reach. Reach. Yeah. But you're feeling it, so you are reaching it, right? I mean, what do you mean by? Well, um, yeah, oh, so, be, okay, sometimes the it, it feels okay. like an overwhelming. And I yeah. suppose I could say, well, be more present or um, sometimes the experts in this field talk about distraction. And by the way, that does have its uses. But I suspect that there is a, that there is a deeper meeting of that experience than just distracting with, you know, bringing the mind outside of the body. I've, I've done meditation experiences with known meditation experts, and they talk about sitting with it and watching it change color and doing various practices. And I've yet to find anything that, quite frankly, feels satisfactory to me. And um, as I get older, you know, I just, I'm going to be 65 next week. This is something that I really need to learn to navigate. And I was wondering if you had any perspective on that. You know, I, I was... Uh worked with hospice for 27 years or something and we had we had a lot of people of course some of the people that were hospice patients were in a lot of pain and there's opiates you know that that help with pain but if it's chronic pain so you know if you're if you're if you have a diagnosis of six months or less and most of these people it was less than six months and there's there's tumor pressure, or there's there's bone uh, cancer, or there's things there's certain types of cancer are more painful than others. You know, it's it's a level, it's a high, very high level if you're not medicated. It's what we call a ten, like the worst, but that means you're you're in agony, like you're, you know, you're weeping, and um, so that's the bottom line. You know, are you going to weep, or it's going to you know just like. Do you think that Superman would would be able to handle a ten a pain ten? No, they Superman would weep because it hurts so much, <laughs> or you'll groan, or you'll just keep you know moving, and you know it's just too much. It's so, so there is certain pain that that uh, you know you could call it overwhelming, and how do you work with it? We we you know with hospice it, it's kind of a little bit too crude. Sometimes we. I wasn't one that did that. So I tried to be, have use a little finesse with what dose they would be on, what opiate dose they'd be on. But unfortunately, for you know, this is being recorded. So, but I think a lot of hospices overdo it. It's easier for them to, you know, they really only need 15 milligrams of morphine every three or four hours. But they're well, I'll give them 20. It'll shut them up, you know. <laughs> Some of that's done out of compassion, and some of it's it's making them too groggy, and it's not necessary. So there's a there's a place where where the patient can say that this is what I need, 
unless they're not clear thinking. If they're clear thinking, they say, oh, that's working. And you listen to the person, you listen, and you listen to your own body, you know. So this isn't working, that isn't working. What is it? And so, unfortunately, you're too young to uh, probably start a dose of opiates. But it's just <laughs> unfortunately, it... Um, it, you you develop a tolerance, and so it's it's like one of those. I say unfortunately, but that's one of life's jokes, you know. Every my mother used to say, everything that's um, you like is either fattening, illegal, or there was not some other word, <laughs> addictive. <laughs> There's a joke like, yeah, the stuff I really like is like it's, it's got a bad result if I do too much of it. But um, so then you go, well, what do I do? You know, what do I do? And so there's not always an easy answer for the, what kind of, you know, there's not always something you just need to question. Just like your psychological pain, your emotional pain, your family pain, your, the world's pain. Like, how do you take that in, that tremendous amount of pain? And, you know, I really like the practice of Tom Lin, uh, which is a, it's, it's originally it was developed in Tibet, but it totally works with Zen. It's like you just like take this pain and um, you take it in into your gut, into your lower belly, and you breathe it up and you breathe out, don't know. Or you could do Kwan and Bosal if you're breathing it out for someone else. You know, you want to give someone love who's suffering, so you send them your love, you send them your love over and over. You grope what's, what they're going through, send love, and through that that don't know love, you can find intuitive ways to maybe even help more uh, in some way. To what, like the way you help the lady with a bumper. You listen to her, you know, and you just, so you listen to, to your person that you love and you see if there's something else that would help them. Um, so the, the Tan Lin brings you to a clear don't know and an exhalation of just questioning, you know, how can I help, or what is this, and bring it, bring it in again. So it is, pain can be worse if we're trying to push it away and just make it different, or, you know, uh, getting tight around it. Um, so it does help to relax and to, to, to own it, own it, and, and just really feel, feel what, what there is to be done. And um, each of us only knows how comfortable we are, and... and each of us only knows that, and we need to use our wisdom of that not knowing to see if there's something that can be done um, for someone else or for myself. Like, what is this? So that's, again, all we're training ourselves to do is tune in, tune in, tune in, and, and don't expect things to be perfect. It's just the perfection is in the imperfection. Really, those are the lessons. And I need to stop because it's the end of the <laughs> lecture thing. <laughs> so thank you both again for your talks and for answering questions today. Just a couple of short announcements to go ahead and wind us down. Uh, this upcoming weekend is one of our Sangha weekends here at the Providence Zen Center. It is Buddha's birthday this upcoming Saturday. And so you're all invited to come and attend. There's going to be a Buddha's birthday ceremony in the morning. There's going to be food, company, Sangha, and Dharma friends. So please come and celebrate the birth of the Buddha. Well, on that day. You can celebrate it right now, too, if you'd like. But Saturday's the big day for it. <laughs> And finally, we're going to have a one-day retreat led by Zen Master Tan Gong. This is going to be April 13th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., in which you can sign up online. I'm speaking to the regulars here today, so you already know my spiel on come to retreats. I don't need to repeat that one for you. Uh, last and not least, practice is always free. Electricity and streaming is not. So if you would like to help support us, we do gratefully accept donations. You can donate online at providencezen.org or through our donation box at the entrance. You can also donate your time, talents, and efforts by signing up to be part of our volunteer program, and sign-up sheets are also near the entrance. So thank you all so much again for coming. <clears throat>